everyone. Um, just going to wait for people to trickle in and we can get started. Um, we have a few pan panelists on, on this webinar today. Satya here is actually from Ireland. Um, Satya, is it, is it late for you there? Yeah, it's around 5 p.m. Um, yeah. Nice. We'll give it a few more minutes um, and we'll get started. All right, so we have about 25, um, 25 people on the call, so we'll get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar um, hosted by Barracuda MSP Security Operations Center. We really appreciate your time um, to take out and understand the attacks originating from Russia. Um, while you're all joining, I'm just going to go over some housekeeping rules. Um, all the attendees will be in listening mode only. Um, or we urge our panelists um, to use the Q&A function um, in the Zoom chat and ask us some questions. Um, we'll be giving away prizes to the most um, engaged attendees um, towards the end. Okay, so speakers, uh, my name is Mariam Khalid. I'm the manager of the security platform engineering team. Um, I lead a team of incident responders. We're on the front line of any breach that happens with our customers. Um, we also have John Port and Satya um, as the speakers today as well. John, if you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi everybody, my name is John Port. Um, I'm a senior cybersecurity analyst here in the uh, Barracuda MSP SOC. Um, I work on the Purple team, which focuses on collaborative security, um, assisting our red team uh, with some threat hunting things and our blue team with um, more complex investigations. Thank you, John. Um, I'm Satya Aladi. I work on the red team and I, uh, I work in threat hunting and uh, handling major incidents and building up the use cases, uh, taking care of our customers. Awesome, thank you, Satya. So the agenda for today, uh, we're gonna be going over a high level of the cyber Russian cyber operations. Um, we're gonna be going over the historical Russian cyber involvement in the past, um, and then we're gonna go over the detailed cyber warfare timeline of the incidents we've seen in the past few months. Um, we're gonna be giving out additional cybersecurity tips to um, our partners and prospect partners. And we're gonna eventually be going over how Barracuda MSP is keeping our partners and customers safe. So um, the first thing we're gonna go over is kind of like um, a high level overview of the current conflict. Before I get into this, I wanna kind of take a step back and reflect on the past history of Russia and Ukraine involvement in cyber warfare. It's actually been going on for many, many years. At this point, back in 2017, um, Russia actually deployed a malware, um, not Pedia, on um, Ukraine critical infrastructure. And what happened here was that it's a destructive malware which took down critical infrastructure. Um, it wiped out their devices. And what happened here was it actually um, spread globally and not just the two parties that was in, that were involved. So what we're seeing in this conflict is that we're kind of seeing signs of that repeat again. We're seeing um, in, in the beginning of January, there was a deployment of Whispergate malware, which is essentially a malware that masquerades as ransomware, but rather than encrypting files, it targets the system master boot record for destruction. And Ultimately, the goal for the Russian government here was to cause disruption within the Ukrainian um, within the within the Ukrainian space and ca cause a source of panic, right? And then towards the end of January, January we saw um, that conflict escalate. We saw different types of um, malwares come into play here. We saw Psychops Blink malware, um, Hermetic Wiper malware. We also saw different campaigns being started, such as the fake SMS campaign that was targeted um, targeted against the Russian, uh, against Ukrainian banks. We also saw some defacement of Ukraine websites. Um, so the, the towards the end of January, that incident started to escalate a lot. And then mid-January, we saw um, the Russian government actually do a DDoS attack targeted towards the government and banks. And what happened here was that the websites actually were offline and they, they, were, they were offline for, for a few hours. And, but what the intention was here was to obviously cause panic. 
Um, towards the end of February, we did see um, Ukraine kind of retaliate back and they were they started outsourcing um, and crowdsourcing IT army of Ukraine. So essentially anyone with cybersecurity skills, they were trying to recruit them to the so-called army so they can kind of protect themselves against any, any Russian attacks. Um, this is something new and we haven't really seen this type of activity in the, in the cyberspace in the past before. Um, towards the beginning of March, um, Russia announced plans to disconnect from the global internet. Um, this is essentially to kind of protect, protect themselves from any, um, any hackers or any attacks um, from the outside. Also, we had groups coming out in support for Ukraine, such as Anoghost, which claimed responsibility for the cyber attacks on the two water supply systems in Russia. And also they claimed responsibility for um, taking the, hacking the um, Russian TV broadcast system. So after reviewing the conflict at kind of like a high over level overview, you guys can see that Russia has very strong cyber capabilities. So John, can you kind of walk us through if this is something you think that's been planned for somehow, so, some time now, or do you think it's something new? Yeah, thanks, Miriam. That's a great overview. Um, to answer your question, yes, I, I truly believe this is something that Russia had been planning for a while. Um, as we, you mentioned, and we can see on the slide here, the, the Russian cyber attacks um, are not new. You know, we, we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, where, you know, the, the, the not pet you met ransomware coming out in 2017 with, you know, the global destruction that that had. Um, going back even further, um, I think we can, most of us remember the um, almost trial-like uh, attacks on the Ukrainian power grid, power grid when uh, Russia literally knocked out the power in Ukraine for you know hours and days at a time. Uh, again, there we have two other incidents of, of Russia intervening through cyberspace. Um, you know, in 2017, attacks on the French presidential campaign and the 2018 uh, targeting of the Winter Games in South Korea with another you know destructive malware. Um, but to kind of pivot off of, you know, we obviously Russian cyber capabilities have grown, um, but the tactics that they're using are, are relatively kind of staying the same. Um, similar to the, um, to the not pet you ransomware that we, that we saw and discussed a little bit. Um, uh, Miriam, you mentioned the hermetic, uh, wiper and whisper gate malware that has been deployed, you know, earlier, just a few months ago in, in 2022 against Ukraine. Um, you know, the, while the malwares weren't structured the same and don't necessarily do the same things, the idea that Russia is using, um, you know, destructive malware to, to, to affect their targets is, uh, is obviously been going on for a while. And to, to put another, uh, you know, layer on top of that, um, it's, it's been attributed that Hermetic Wiper and Whispergate have been attributed to um, the Voodoo Bear uh, ATP, which has since been um, identified and attributed to the Russian GRU. So, so for um, over the past few months, our SOC has done, um, our Security Operations Center has done an immense amount of threat hunting um, on the situation that John just went over. So, Satya, would you mind? Um, going a little deeper and walking us through the timeline of the incident starting January uh, 14th. Yeah, sure. Thank you, John. Thank you, Miriam. Um, so there are lots of APT groups and malwares that have been deployed during these kind of uh, campaigns starting from Jan 14th and 523. We could see a lot of website defacement have been observed, uh, specifically on the uh, financial sector. Um, and they have uh, publish the onion sites to access this one and pay some bitcoins in order to uh, make them up again and coming to jan 15 we could see whispergate malware has been uh, installed through a firmware software um, update that has been pushed through one of the reputed vendor firewall um, and it has actually wiped out the master boot record um, and later on there has been a signature released for this one and there has been a Crimea based threat group on uh, coming to the end of Jan 31st. Um, that the group name is Actinium, um, very well known group. Um, it is also called as Gameradon. And this group is specifically involved in spying and exfiltration. Uh, several kind of uh, spear phishing emails and uh, smishing that is sending SMS uh, to all the people in Ukraine has been observed. 
to create panic among the people. Um, and many of the ATM machines have been malfunctioning as well. And uh, by the FIB um, 16th, we have observed like DDoS attacks have been happening on the Ukrainian government and financial sector by well-known botnets, Mirai and Miris. Um, and these were to uh, bring down the networks for a couple of hours. It's not like completely they have destroyed, like installing some ransomware. Um, and then uh, later on February 23rd, we could see Cyclops Blink malware has been targeting the network devices. Like I said, this particular malware uh, is a supply chain uh, malware, I can say. They have pushed this through firmware up upgrade um, from one of the firewall. And later on, they got this one and able to uh, block this one through collaboration from Microsoft. And uh, by Feb ending, we could see a couple of malwares of same family, Hermetic Viper, Isaac Viper malware. So uh, these malware specifically, uh, once executed, they wipe out the malware boot record. So these are all the collections from um, uh, initial Jan and Feb month. Um, let's go to the uh, further what happened uh, by the next month. Uh, so yeah. So, so Satya, let, let me ask you this. Um, you mentioned something about um, DDoS attacks. Do you, why do you think the Russian government is going more towards DDoS attacks instead of um, going directly and deploying ransomware on the Ukrainian um, infrastructure? Yeah, that's a good question. Like John had said that Russia has uh, uh, many APT groups which could actually cause uh, a bad damage to the uh, Ukrainian government, but they have just launched DDoS. Uh, the main reasons I feel is like they don't want to destroy the infrastructure possibly after occupying any of their uh, infrastructure. They don't want to spend again and rebuild them from scratch. That's the reason they have not installed ransomware, which would actually destroy the hard disks and all. Um, and the other reason is they want to make sure that their videos are circulating among the people, uh, which is very much needed to uh, create panic situation and chaos among the people. Got it. You also mentioned something about wiper malware. Um, mm -hmm. Again, wh why do you think the Russian government is going towards mal um, wiper malware, which masquerades as ransomware, but without their encryption? Um, why do you think these threat actors are avoiding encryption? So this wiper malware and Cyclops, if you observe, like they have been pushed out not to just encrypt. They have been pushed out to spy. They have been pushed out to accelerate the data to gather more information what is going on in the country. So that is one of the main reason I feel that they have not destroyed it, but just install that one so that they can spy what is going on in the country. And apart from that, they can again reuse the systems without any issues if they come into the country and occupy that. So I'll take it over from here, Satya. Thank you for going through. Um, you know, January and, and most of February. Um, I'll pick it up on February 25th. Um, so on February 25th, two, point, uh, two things actually happened. Uh, we started seeing uh, some targeted phishing attacks against uh, Ukrainian soldiers from a uh, threat actor known as Ghostwriter. Um, these types of uh, phishing attacks were kind of new in the cyberspace as we started to see a uh, browser in browser in browser based attack um, which is actually a little bit more difficult to uh, determine if it actually is a phishing uh, or a credential harvester um, window. Um, and the reason behind that is it's, it exploits the SSO uh, login capabilities that we have all grown to, to become very fond of um, utilizing, you know, login through Microsoft or login through, through uh, Google or, or Facebook. Um, and essentially what they were doing is literally copying that exact uh, window and placing an iframe behind that window to then redirect everything out to uh, a command and control server. Um, so the other thing that happened on February 25th is that the Conti ransomware group, and I hope you all know Conti, um, you know, got a lot of fame in the, the past uh, six months or so, um, and said that it's, it fully supports the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, and that it will use its infrastructure and, and techniques to strike back against anyone who wants to, uh, you know, oppose Russia or, or, in, or um, you know, stop the invasion of any type. Um, then actually a few days later, the Conti chat logs were, were leaked by a Ukrainian hacker. Um, the Conti chat logs actually were about 
60,000 chat logs for about a year dating back to January of 2021. Um, so about a year worth of chat logs were leaked by a Ukrainian hacker. Um, the next day we saw Lockbit ransomware group issuing an official statement that they are not getting involved. They have no involvement. They have no, they're not taking sides in the, in the international conflict. Um, fast forward a few more days and Russia in, announces that it plans to disconnect from the global internet. Following that, a, uh, a, Russia, a Russian, I'm sorry, a, uh, a hacker group, Anonymous, claims responsibility for hacking and shutting down two water supply systems, um, which impacted a handful of, of Russian cities and in turn affected about 300 to 350,000 uh, Russian citizens. So, John, you mentioned something about um, Conti, um, Conti chat logs being leaked. Why, why do you think this plays an important role in this in this whole conflict? Yeah, that's it's a great question. Um, this is the chat logs that were leaked from Conti. Um, you know, have the potential to be you know analyzed for you know incriminating information, to say the least. Um, from what I've seen so far, and other security researchers that have have looked into the chat logs, have actually found some some pretty incriminating information, such as, you know, Bitcoin addresses that were used, um, supposedly compromised targets that weren't publicly, um, you know, disclosed, as well as some additional known publicly known and unknown uh, command and control domains, um, and you know these these this type of information can you know potentially down the line lead towards, you know, uh, federal investigations, law enforcement investigations, which can in turn lead to, in, uh, lead to indictments or, or arrests. You also mentioned that um, Russia is quote unquote disconnecting from, from the internet. Why do you think Russia would take such a dramatic step? Um, well, I think when, this, when the, the news first came out, I think there was a, a lot of panic and a lot of shock. Um, and I think it's important to clear up that Russia itself is not disconnecting its entire country from the global internet. Um, instead, they were moving all of their state-sponsored domains and servers to Russian-controlled infrastructure. Um, and I think they gave a deadline of March 11th for that to happen. Um, their official reasoning behind that and uh, to move all of their stuff to, to Russian-controlled infrastructure was to protect themselves in, in the cyberspace to uh, put themselves in a better security position to protect themselves from cyber attacks that they were facing. Um, but, you know, with every decision and every consequence, there's two sides to, to, to every story. Um, I think another reason that they chose to do this is because um, it's, it's no secret that Russia has been, you know, controlling or, or trying to control what their citizens are able to, to get in terms of news and information. Um, you know, previously Ru uh, Russia had blocked platforms such as, you know, BBC News, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, and other platforms to kind of inhibit their citizens from getting that type of, from getting the real world information. And I think that moving all of these state sponsored domains uh, to Russian infrastructure really gives them another leg up and an, a, a tighter grip around uh, the information that their citizens get. Got it. So, so this is a lot of cyber activity we just covered. And as you guys can see, there's different entities at play here. I think our audience would definitely benefit from um, like a visualization of which entities are pro-Russian and which entities are anti-Russian. Um, Satya, if you want to walk us through this map. Like John said, um, there are two sides for everything. So in this one also, we could see that they, uh, there are some of the APT groups which have been uh, supporting Russian uh, country and some people who have prepared uh, IT army of Ukraine, which has been created by the chief of the country. And many of the um, people who has the knowledge of hacking have joined this group and they have supported Ukraine. So if you see the pro-Russian people, the main one is Conti, like John had said, and um, another one are free civilian stormers ransomware. Um, these are the people actually have been uh, involved in um, causing a lot of damage to the Ukraine infrastructure. And there is uh, one more group for pro-Russian that is Belarusian cyber um, partisans, which is actually uh, responsible 
um, for uh, launching attacks on the trains and even um, the electrical grids as well. Um, there are uh, people from uh, Ukraine and even entire West as well. So many people have joined the IT Army of Ukraine who have been supporting uh, the Ukraine country. Um, the one named Anonymous became very famous because he was behind uh, the leakage of Conti uh, source code. And there are a few other uh, groups have been involved in this one, like Kelvin Sec and NB6 against the West like that. Um, so, and there are uh, multiple malwares and um, uh, various APT groups have been involved on both the sides. So we could see that uh, the people from Ukraine had been uh, doing this as a support for the country of the Ukraine. Um, yeah, so this is uh, what we about the Russia-Ukraine cyber war participants. So given the different entities in play here, what, what risks do are we facing right now and who is at risk? Um, yeah. Go ahead, Satya. Go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, I think it, that's a great question to, to ask. Um, you know, everybody's really wondering, you know, what their risk level is um, in terms of, you know, the emerging threats and, and what's going on right now. Um, and with a, uh, you know, with, with the situation that's been going on recently, um, Ukraine has undoubtedly been taking the, the largest uh, amount of attacks and taking the brunt of the Russian cyber activity. But it's important to take a step back and say, wait a second, this isn't you know, just going to affect Ukraine. This, this has the potential to affect everybody, um, you know, specifically organizations such as you know, government entities, um, speci or, uh, you know, specifically you know, critical SCADA infrastructure, as we saw. Um, you know, Anonymous took down some, some SCADA water supply systems in Russia. Um, any politically motivated or politically associated organizations, you know, is always a target for um, hacktivists who don't really care about uh, financial compensation. They just, you know, want to make want to make themselves known and make a kind of kind of want to see the world burn, for lack of a better term. Um, you know, and and also I know we have a lot of our MSPs and our partners on here. Um, MSPs are certainly a a target as well for for these types of attacks because. Um, you know, in, in theory, a, a threat actor could breach one organization, an MSP, and then have access to, you know, all of their end customers and, and breach many organizations by, by exploiting one organization. So we just, we just went over a lot of information here, right? We, we walked through the timeline of the incident on um, the different types of malwares that we're seeing, the different types of tactics and techniques that we're seeing. Um, but I think the most important thing here is um, looking at this as how we can protect ourselves, um, given the situation with Russia and Ukraine. If, God forbid, this happens again in the future, are, are we protected? Um, is our network protected? So as John, John mentioned, the, there's a lot of entities who could be at risk here. And I, I think it's safe to say that um, an organization that has any sort of attack surface is at risk. Um, so I think these are some tips that we can kind of take away from this. Um, the first one is obviously um, MFA, multi-factor authentication. Having MFA enabled on all your applications, on your SA all of your SaaS-based solutions um, is a must for all of your employees. This will just add that extra layer of verification. And, and we've seen this a lot where attacks have been prevented by, by a, single, a single step such as MFA. Um, Something else that I think is really important for um, partners and um, organizations to understand is the, is the security awareness training, um, making sure all of their employees are well versed in the basic cyber attacks that happened in the day to day. Um, this could essentially, um, an, an employee should be able to um, identify a phishing email that comes into their inbox, right? or identify some sort of um, suspicious activity on their device. If that knowledge is there from that employee to employee um, basis, um, that that could really stop a widespread attack from happening. Um, another tip is that we need to ensure we're enabling conditional access on, on, on all SaaS solutions. This could be Office 365, Azure, um, essentially, blocking access to locations um, that you don't do business with or locations where you don't have any, any employees that reside and that, that also um, 
decreases the attack surface. Um, we want to make sure all your systems are patched um, and up to date. It's important that all your on-prem and um, cloud software services are all patched. It's important to have a team in place who is responsible for this. As you guys know, there's exploits coming out um, literally every, every day. And it's important that you have someone on your team that's responsible for this and patching this um, as, as this comes out. Um, staying on top of emerging threats, I think this kind of ties into the exploits that are coming out day to day. So staying on top of what vulnerability comes out today, um, being, being um, notified by that. So that's actually something Scout, Barracuda Scout XDR does with our current partners is we send out um, threat advisories to all of our customers and all our partners on any vulnerabilities or exploits that we think are beneficial and we think that our customers need to take action on. Um, you need to have an incident response team in place. I think this is very important. Um, the time an incident happens and the time it's eradicated and remediated against, um, unfortunately, that is the average time for that is very, very long. And having an incident response team in place will, will help bridge that gap and make sure that if a breach does happen in your organization, you have a team that's well-versed in the eradication and the remediation steps that you have to, you have to do. Um, you wanna ensure you have a backup in place. Um, as you guys know, ransomware is um, having backup in place if a ransomware incident does happen, it's very critical because your, your devices and your, your files get encrypted. So if you don't have a backup, it's you're losing all that data. You wanna make sure it's backed up at a, um, at a good at a good interval, it's backed up and it's safe, right? Um, you wanna deploy an XD, extended detection response software, um, XDR, um, essentially an XDR SOC. So what this would do is it, um, the software would be able to ingest all of your logs from on-prem SAS, from EDR, and ingest it into one platform and one software where it's able to um, correlate different events and detect suspicious activity on your network and alert you as, as that activity is detected. So how is Barracuda keeping you safe? So I just kind of went over the tips that you can do today, right, to, to make yourself safe. But how, what are we doing to keep our current partners safe? So um, where our SOC security operation team, um, ever since this global high-end escalation has happened where we're, we've constantly been threat hunting um, and researching the different tactics and techniques um, Russia and Ukraine have been using towards each other. And we're, we're, we're taking those tax, tactics and techniques and implementing some sort of detection methods on our end so we can, we can alert on that on our customers. We've actually created a visualization for easy threat hunting for our SOC. Um, so it's a single pane of glass where our SOC can go and um, visualize and detect anything that needs to dig that we need to dig deeper into anything that we need to alert our customers on we've also sent as i as i said before we've all we sent out advisories to our customers we've sent out actually three advisories um, in relation to this the recent events such as um the high end the high end conflict we've sent out the advisories regarding the destruction destruction malware such as whispergate um, we've created relevant rules that detect data um, exfiltration. So as you guys know, um, when there is some sort of attack, like ransom, ra ransomware or some sort of ex ex extortion, a data exfiltration is usually one of the things that happens um, right off the bat. So we have detection methods in place that will detect any high data exfiltrations outbound to Russia. Um, high, high outbound traffic um, to Russia, as we mentioned, DDoS attack is something that Russia uses as a tactic and technique, right, towards Ukraine. So anything that we think is anomaly based and that an organization didn't have high, high outbound traffic to Russia, and if, if we're seeing um, a higher outbound traffic and higher volume, that's something that we alert on. Um, Psychops detection, hermetic wiper, and whispered break gate, these are all destructive malware that Russia is utilizing right now. So we have detection methods currently for that and really any other TTPs related to international cyber warfare between Russia and Ukraine. We have a dedicated team that research and develops these, these detection methods to make sure our customers are safe. Um, as I mentioned before, we, we, we set out threat advisory. So it's actually free and um, it's available to everyone. So if you guys like, you guys can 
scan this QR code and this will directly take you to the website. And Jared, if you wanna send, put the link in the chat as well for our partners. So that link will be in the chat. Um, so we went over a lot today, right? We went over the, the, over the timeline and the overview of the conflict. We went over the historical capability of um, Russia. And we also went over the different entities at play and tips and techniques that you guys can do to keep yourself safe. I think the main thing that we wanna get off, get away from this webinar today is that having a security, a strong security posture right now is um, more important than ever. Um, I think the rise of cyber warfare is gonna increase as, as we go on. And I think every every organization as is a, is at risk for a potential target if you do have some sort of attack vector or attack surface. Um, we're also seeing some, some entities kind of engage in hackback attacks, and this is not something that we kind of stand by. This is not something that we, that we reflect best practices with. If an incident does happen, the best way to kind of remediate that is to go through the incident response cycle is to er eradicate um, and do your recovery and learn your lessons from it and make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, also, one more thing is that companies' reputation are at stake here as well. Um, if there is a small breach that happens, um, you could suffer from, from a reputation that you've built for over many, many years due to a small, a small incident or a small breach that, that happened that could have been prevented by something as simple as, um, as enabling MFA. Um, so, Satya, did you have any other final thoughts that you wanted to share with our with our attendees today? Yeah, sure. So um, like you said, uh, we should have um, the security operations team who is monitoring the 24 by seven, um, all the traffic that is going outside and coming inside um, and make sure that uh, everything is proper and anything that is suspicious should be alerted immediately and uh, action should be taken. Um, so we should have a layered security and a 24 by seven security uh, team that who monitors this particular traffic, which would actually help uh, the team um, to be uh, staying proactive. So, and um, doing the threat hunting regularly and being proactive about the tactics and techniques, these threat actor groups, um, what they have been using, uh, which will help us not only to concentrate on um, the indicators of compromise, uh, which actually uh, keep passing away, but like we stay ahead by hunting these particular TTPs, which really helps. So I want to stress on that one, um, how Barracuda actually stays ahead by uh, doing the regular threat hunt. Yeah. Awesome. Um, John, do you want to give us your thoughts on the global impact and conclusion? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that, um, you know, these larger ATPs aren't just going after, you know, the big, the large scale targets. Um, Granted, they might want to get there, but the way that they get there might not be just directly attacking, you know, the big guy, because typically the big guy has a lot of cybersecurity measures in place. So, you know, state sponsored actors are looking for any way to get in and, and navigate around. And that might be targeting, you know, different vendors that you work with or targeting, uh, you know, local government systems that don't have that, that large and, and large scale and, and defense and depth strategy in place. Um, so it's, it's, important to understand and, and know your risk in terms of, you know, the vendors that you work with, the systems that you have externally facing. Um, and, you know, uh, again, you know, pivoting onto the next point, um, the risk involved with, you know, storing your personal, uh, your PII, your personal identifiable, uh, personal identification. Um, you know, more now more than ever is, 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 it's important to make sure that you're the information that you're storing is encrypted, you know, both at rest and, and in transit, um, because there's, there's tactics and procedures and, and tools that can be used to, you know, to grab that, um, you know, information wherever it may be. Um, so understanding, you know, you know, what, what you can do and what your risk is in terms of the personal information that you store, whether it's your, your employees, your clients, um, it doesn't matter. It's, it's all, you know, extremely important to, to have under lock and key. Um, you know, I, we talked about this uh, again a little bit before, but, you know, m most businesses that we deal with are very apprehensive with communication to Russia or, you know, some of those, those big name countries that you don't want to be communicating with or don't do a lot of business with. 
Um, and, you know, kind of pivoting off of Miriam's point of the conditional access that we talked about on the last slide, it's important to, you know, block any potential communications that your, your company doesn't expect. You know, if, for example, if, if you're a US-based company and you're doing business only in the US, there's no reason that you should really be, you know, sending, uh, you know, communication or, or, or traffic out to somewhere like Russia or China or, you know, um, Iran. Um, those are definitely things that we can proactively do to stay on top of, uh, you know, potential risk and, and, and breaches down the line by just geo-blocking, you know, countries that you don't do business with. Um, and finally, I think, you know, we mentioned it a lot in the beginning of the, of the presentation here, where, you know, the global impact of a cyber attack up to this point is really best summed up in the not pet, pet you malware, which again was developed by Russia um, and used to attack Ukraine. But the way that the not pet you malware was, was um, built was a wormable fashion. So just because it was deployed on its in, intended target, the wormable fashion actually made its way across, you know, cyberspace into, you know, hundreds and thousands of um, other organizations that were affected and caused, as we see here, billions of dollars in damages um, across the globe. So just because, you know, something's going on across the world doesn't mean, um, you know, it's never going to come back and, and appear in, in, your, in, in your backyard essentially. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, John. I think closing this, this webinar out with the not petty example is, is really is perfect because it really sums up the, the point where we're trying to get across here is that a cyber attack between or like cyber warfare between two entities um, can have a global impact and can affect entities that are not directly aimed at. And I think we need to like do our best to help protect each other. So I'm just gonna hand off to Jared here. Yeah, so thank you, Miriam, John, and Satya. That was definitely one of the most educational um, webinars that I've seen on this topic personally. Um, we are gonna get to Q&A in just a moment. So we do have a, a few questions that came in and let's start off with the first one being what are the prominent attacks to see in the next couple of weeks towards the United States? So, yeah, I, I can take that, Jerry. Thank you. I think that's a really good question. I think we've already kind of, we're already kind of seeing an uptick in a lot of DDoS activity from Russia and Ukraine. Um, I, I think that DDoS activity will lead, or that port scanning activity will lead to attacks such as um, ransomware. So it's it's very important that you know we make sure our attack surfaces are decreased as much as we can. So and we've we've already seen I think personally um, in my day to day um, as part of the security operations center, I've definitely seen an uptick in in these types of attacks that are happening. Thank you for that. We have a, another question that came in. Um, can you please elaborate on how significantly the number of attacks has grown? since the Russia-Ukraine conflict? Um, was the threat environment already on a statistically high level upward trend? Yes, uh, we could see a uh, um, frequent increase uh, from the Russian countries, uh, specifically these Konti ransomware, though we found that the source code has been, looked, uh, has been leaked. Um, so they have developed a new infrastructure, command and control infrastructure. And we could see the attacks from the same group has been increased a lot. If you could see uh, recently, they have been uh, leaking many other major vendors. Um, so we, we cannot say that this particular uh, county gang or any other uh, groups uh, which have been involved in this ransomware uh, are not silent. They have been uh, frequently increased and we could see a huge amount of traffic coming from Russia and going outside as well. Thank you, Satya. And our last question here, um, do you believe hybrid warfare will be a common approach to target victims in the future? Yeah, uh, this could be a means of targeting because uh, most of the things, most of the um, like machinery or infrastructure, even the trains and TVs, every area is managed through the IT, right? 
So wherever there is IT, wherever there are systems and mechanisms, obviously there are chances to target them. If you see a lot of the attacks in the Middle East countries are happening on the petroleum side because they manage their entire system with the uh, network and even the computer center. also wherever you have this one the attacks are possible and when coming specifically to uh, any kind of wars like this whatever it is happening they they might be doing this one to support their own countries great and and there were a few other questions that were product and service related um, we will be in touch with you all uh, through email and through our follow-up uh, we will be sending a recording out and a copy of the slide deck to all of the attendees today as well Again, just wanna give a big thank you to our panelists who took the time out of their day and also to all of our attendees. Um, and that'll do it. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks, John. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming Thanks, out. Yeah. Take care, guys.